was uh, amazing sharing. Um, so the, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. James Chin, Professor uh, Dr. James Chin, who is a professor in, of Asian Studies. Uh, he's uh, from University of Tasmania, Australia, but he is originally a Sarawakian. So Professor Chin is widely regarded as the leading scholar of contemporary Sabah and Sarawak. So he has published numerous uh, publications on subject on, of his presentation today. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, James Chin to, uh, to with his presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to start off by thanking the organizers uh, for the kind invitation to say a few words. So my thought is completely different from everybody else. Uh, I want to take a, a larger view of what's happening with Borneo. Uh, given the fact that this is a Borneo forum, uh, although the first four speakers were barely uh, very Sabah centric, I think I can just uh, maybe widen the picture a bit so that uh, you know, we will have a wider perspective of what is happening. Uh, given the very uh, short time that I have, uh, I just want to cover basically two huge areas. Uh, the first one is, I think it's very important when we talk about Borneo, we understand the basic data. Uh, from there, I want to move on very quickly to the geostrategic considerations when we talk about Borneo. And here, when I refer to Borneo, I'm referring to the entire island, uh, not just Sabah, Sarah, or Brunei. So when we talk about uh, Borneo, I think it's very important that we understand that uh, Borneo is actually the world's third largest island. In terms of land size, it's about twice the size of Germany. So it's a huge piece of land. Uh, but yet in terms of the population, it's actually a very, very small. Uh, you have a population of about only 24 million people spread across three countries. Uh, but even though we have a very small population, but in terms of di uh, biodiversity, uh, Borneo is actually quite remarkable. In terms of land area, it's less than 1% of the world's land area, but it holds 6% of global uh, biodiversity. Uh, there are 15,000 plant species uh, that we know of. There are still many, many plant species that we do not know of. So that's the reason why you see a lot of botanists from the West, from the advanced countries, uh, they come regularly to Kalimantan, to Sabah and Surat to study the biodiversity there. Uh, there has been 400 new species that's been found since 1994, and 222 mammals live there. And what is really important is that a quarter of them, 44 of them, are unique to Borneo. In other words, uh, if Borneo does not exist, uh, these animals will not exist. Uh, the other key data, which I think is important for the viewers now, is that uh, Borneo plays a major role in terms of climate change. Uh, this has got to do with a very simple thing called carbon sequestration. In other words, the forest in Borneo basically sucking all the carbon dioxide and keep it there. And at night, of course, they release oxygen. Uh, we all understand that the loss of forests contribute uh, around the world, uh, contribute about 30% of what we call the global greenhouse effect. Uh, this is the thing that basically causes the world uh, in terms of climate change, uh, the rise in temperature to happen. And this is a very, very serious issue. Uh, even if the global temperature rise by 1%, uh, we're talking about millions of lives uh, at stake. Now, link on to this, right, about how important Borneo is in terms of biodiversity and a place for carbon uh, uh, sinking, right? Uh, there's this huge thing called the Heart of Borneo Project. Uh, it always amazed me that very few people in Sabah and Sra and Brunei actually heard about this. So that's the reason why I bring it up. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a major international agreement that covers the three governments found on the island of Borneo, which is Brunei, Darussalam, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and they signed an agreement to create this thing called Heart of Borneo Project. Uh, this is a very important document because it shows that there's international recognition that we must protect as much of Borneo as possible because of all the reasons I, I gave earlier. And yet, uh, ironically, the normal public, the job public on the streets of uh, Sabah and Sarawak have never heard of this project. Now, in terms of political boundaries, uh, I think it's very important we, again, we go through the basic data. Uh, the states of Sabah and Sarawak in the Malaysian Federation only have about 7 million people. 
on the Indonesian side, the Kalimantan side, they only have about 17 million people. Brunei does not even reach half a million. So we're talking about a total population only slightly above 24 million. Uh, for the rest of the world, I think most people have heard of Borneo, uh, places like uh, you know, in, in, in Germany. The word Borneo is actually uh, uh, widely known. In places like Japan, it's widely associated with a cartoon uh, book. Uh, people, when they know about Malaysia, they've heard of Sabah and Sarawak, but all they know is that Sabah and Sarawak is located in East Malaysia, uh, 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 located on the island of Borneo. And a, a lot of people, of course, have heard of Brunei. Uh, because Brunei has been uh, compared to as, as you know, it's like those uh, rich Arab states where there's abundance of oil and money. So people have heard of East Malaysia, they've heard of Brunei. Uh, but the word Kalimantan is actually uh, not widely known around the world uh, until quite recently, and all because of this big media hype over a thing called Nusantara, supposedly the new capital of the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, the other basic figure I think is very important when you talk about Borneo is that 70% uh, of Borneo comes under Indonesian control, actually 74%. Huh? And what is interesting about Kalimantan is that Kalimantan has lots of untapped natural resources. Uh, if you go beyond the city, uh, the major cities of Kalimantan, like Samarinda, Balepata, all this thing, right? Uh, the entire piece of Kalimantan is really, really underdeveloped. Uh, other than the oil and gas uh, uh, industry, which is based in Bali Bapang, which is the uh, country hub. The oil and gas hub is actually, for Indonesia, is actually Bali Bapang. And of course, I think one of the other speakers have mentioned that uh, Kalimata is actually split into five regions. So this gives you an idea how big the place is. 65% huh? uh, of the indigenous people, 65% uh, uh, of the population in Kalimata are actually uh, consists of the indigenous people. But there's also a huge percentage, about 30% uh, of the population are actually uh, non-Indigenous. Now, when I tell people these people are actually very surprised. Uh, they say that this place is so underdeveloped, so why do people move there? Uh, the major reason is that it's because of an Indonesian program called Trans by Gracie, where the Indonesian state, the government itself, uh, pay for the resettlement of poor people, uh, mostly what we call land settlers. Huh? Uh, there's been a lot of misconception about this program. It was actually started by the Dutch, uh, not by the current Indonesian government. Huh? It started by the Dutch. Uh, so approximately for the last uh, 50, 60 years, uh, they've moved about 3 million people to Kalimantan. And of course, the most prominent among them are the Maldives and, and the Javanese. Uh, this has led to a lot of conflict uh, between the people from uh, Java, Maldives, and the local population. And this led to the infamous uh, ethnic conflict uh, between 1999 and 2001, where about 4,000 people were killed. Uh, overwhelming majority of those killed were people from the transmigrancy program. Now on the Sabah Sarawak side, of course, in the past decade, we've seen a lot of political awakening among the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak, the Dites of Sarawak and the Kediyat of Sabah. Uh, so it's all about state nationalism. Uh, like for example, you know, Sabah for Sabahans, Sarawak for Sarawakians. Uh, but in political science literature, is we refer to this thing is basically self-determination. Huh? People are asking for self-determination. And what is not widely known on this side, huh, on Sabah and Sarawak side, is that this thing has been happening for a lot longer on the Indonesian side. Uh, but what is unusual is that you don't find uh, calls for self-determination in Brunei. This only happens in uh, Sabah, Sarawak, and Kalimantan. So given the very limited time, let me quickly move to the geostrategic considerations of Borneo. Uh, one of the interesting things about Borneo and why it's so important is that Borneo is actually facing the conflict zone. And when I talk about the conflict zone, I'm talking about the South China Sea. Uh, right now, as we speak, the big powers are competing. Uh, big powers, basically China versus the West, uh, they are competing about who controls the South China Sea. Uh, it is uh, unfortunate that Unfortunate that a lot of people in Sabah and Sarawak uh, do not understand this conflict. Uh, part of it is because there's been under-reporting of the conflict. Uh, another reason is that there's a very high level of censorship from the Malaysian side in terms of reporting on this conflict. Huh? Uh, for example, there's been a lot of uh, uh, near uh, uh, tensions or uh, warships between the Americans and the Chinese. They sail very close to each other. Uh, their fighter planes fly very close to each other. So they sort of provoke each other. And it's happening uh, quite regularly. 
Uh, the other area where it happens quite regularly is Chinese fishing boats enter Malaysian waters uh, regularly. Uh, when I say regularly, I'm talking about uh, more than 100 incidents a year. A year. Uh, their favorite place where they do a lot of fishing, interestingly enough, is a place called James Shore, uh, named after me. That's a joke. Uh, but it's located off the coast of Bintulu, James Shore. So because of this, the big powers have a great interest in what happens in Borneo, especially in terms of Sabah, Sarawak, and Peninsula, Malaysia, and Malaya. Uh, the reason is people, if you if you adjust strategies, right, you look at it, you will first thing that you'll notice is that Malaysia is the only country that surrounds uh, the whole of the South China Sea. And of course, in terms of uh, climate change and biodiversity, uh, Borneo is very important as well. So the location itself is very important. Second is that I think a lot of people in Sabah and Sarawak do not realize that uh, Borneo in the middle of Kalimantan is actually the center of the archipelago. Uh, this means that uh, Borneo is surrounded by all the major waterways of Southeast Asia. So if you look at the South China Sea, Java Sea, Makassar, Salabas Sea, Sulu Sea, all this one way or another faces Borneo. In other words, uh, if you talk about uh, the marine time, Southeast Asia, right? Uh, uh, Borneo actually sits right in the middle of marine time Southeast Asia. And of course, maritime sea routes are very important. 80% of all the world's uh, goods are uh, shipped by containers. <clears throat> uh, another important geostrategic uh, uh, consideration, of course, is that Indonesia is becoming very, very important. Again, uh, for all sorts of historical reasons, this is underreported in Malaysia. Uh, many people do not realize that uh, Indonesia is actually a member of the G20. Uh, G20 consists of the world's uh, top 20 economies. And, and, and Indonesia uh, is the largest economy in Southeast Asia. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, the purchasing power parity, Indonesia is the top 10 of the world's economy, number seven at the present moment. And all indicators are that Indonesia will be the world's fourth largest economy by 2045. Huh? So that's only about like 20 years away. So it is, it is not like, you know, you're looking at something that's very, very far. Uh, within the lifespan of many of us who are watching this uh, seminar now. Now, of course, uh, people are getting very excited about developments in Kalimantan, especially the uh, advent of the new capital. So there's always a potential spillover from a strong growth in Indonesia to spill over not only for Sabah and Sarawak, but for the whole region. I, but I think for me personally, I think what is really important uh, in terms of development in Indonesia is that Indonesia is going opposite of what Malaysia is going through. Uh, Indonesia, if you look at all the recent studies that show that Indonesians are actually getting uh, more circular, they're getting more pluralistic, and in some ways they're getting more democratic, but Malaysia is sort of going the other way around. And of course, Indonesia has always played a leading role in ASEAN. In the coming years, it's even more important because Southeast Asia will be sitting between two giants. And when I talk about two giants, I'm talking about India and China. So there's no way to escape this. This is the geostrategic reality. And of course, Indonesia has a huge population, uh, 250 million, huge untapped human resource. So in many ways, right, uh, in terms of looking at Sabah and Sarai, you really have to think about uh, what will Indonesia do because you really can't run away uh, from two things. You can't run away from the Chinese shadow and you can't run away from the Indonesian shadow. Now, I want to spend just a very, very brief uh, uh, meaning on the capital Nusantara. I know there's a huge amount of interest, especially among the business community in Sabah and Sarawak, uh, because they think, that, oh, this is a major uh, development. Uh, the Indonesian government has earmarked 34 billion US dollars uh, for this project. Uh, sooner or later, some of it will spill into Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, my, my, my take is that you have to be very cautious. Uh, this may not happen, and I'll tell you the reason why it may not happen. Uh, the reason is, if you read the bill that was passed in the Indonesian parliament uh, recently, it says that uh, the building of Nusantara will not start until 2024, right? Uh, what is 2024? 2024 is the year of the presidential election. In other words, in the first half of 2024, you will have a new Indonesian president. Jokowi cannot stand for the presidency. In Indonesia, they're smart enough to limit the presidency to two terms. Jokowi has been there for 10 years, and therefore, for whatever reasons, if the successor doesn't want the capital to happen, it will not happen, okay? So, you have, I mean, there are other reasons as well. I just don't have time to go into it. 
all I'm saying is that in terms of this, uh, uh, you know, mad rush to say all these wonderful things about uh, Nusantara and Kalimantan, you have to keep this in the back of your mind. It may not happen. Eh? And the other reasons why it may not happen is that the model itself is quite a interesting model, they're going to try to follow the Putrajaya model, which is the business capital will remain Jakarta, but administrative capital is in Kalimantan. Uh, the difference is Putrajaya, there's highway, max highway that links Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya. You can get to Putrajaya in one hour. Uh, that is not possible between Jakarta and uh, Nusantara. So I want to quickly uh, finish off by talking about Brunei. Uh, Brunei, as you all know, has always been tied to oil and gas. And uh, I think the questions in the future in terms of geostrategic analysis is that what will happen when the oil and gas runs out? Uh, can the Bruneians find something to replace the loss in revenue? And also the question is, now, can the big powers guarantee the existence of Brunei? Uh, in terms of Sabah and Sarawak, I think we will see the continued rise of state nationalism. Uh, early on, we had two speakers, uh, Dastri Simon and Dr. James, who spoke. Uh, about the historical grievances, the unhappiness, uh, whether this will lead uh, to a change in the, in, in the structure of the federal-state relations uh, in terms of, of uh, the Federation of Malaysia, especially a special subset of federal-state relationship, a new structure just for uh, Pujajaya, Puchin and Kinabalu, uh, that still remains to be seen. Uh, in terms of Sabah, you have this unique issue, the PTI issue. Uh, the other thing is people get excited about the Borneo Highway. Will it be a game changer? Unfortunately, my answer is no, it will not be a game changer. Uh, what it will do is that it will make it easier for transportation between Sabah and Sarawak, but it's not going to fundamentally change the economies of Sabah and Sarawak. I think for the, uh, for the older generation, I think the big question uh, coming up is that uh, will the next generation, the younger generation of Sabahans and Sarawakians, will they be more uh, Malaysianized or Malayanized or will they retain the special character of Sabahans and Sarawakians? And I think my good friend Philip has uh, alluded to it in his, in his uh, concluding remarks to his presentation. And of course, uh, the big worry among the older people in Sabah and Sarawak is that Malaya seems to be heading down uh, towards uh, ethnic and religious conflict especially between the Muslim and non-Muslims. And the question is that, uh, will Sabah and Sarawak follow, especially when Malaya is sort of hell-bent on building a Malay Islamic state? And of course, the last point on the map in terms of geostrategic uh, considerations that uh, in the last 10 years, I've seen a very huge flow of talented people from both Sabah and Sarawak. They've gone uh, outside the state uh, simply because uh, two things, they've lost faith in the ability of the state to manage and secondly, they have also lost, uh, what do you call it, uh, lost faith uh, in terms of the future potential for themselves. In other words, they think that their future will be a lot better outside the state. So I'm not talking about just uh, migrating to, to uh, Clan Valley. I'm talking about people actually leaving the country as a whole. Uh, of course, the first point, if they want to retain close family links, uh, they will move to Singapore. But I've seen a lot of top-notch uh, human talent or, or, or human resource talent from Sabah, Sarawak, they've disappeared to the West. And I can guarantee you uh, for a whole host of reasons, uh, these people can never move back to Sabah and Sarawak, no matter what you offer them. It is just not possible, not by practical terms, uh, to move back to Sabah and Sarawak. So I think to summarize, uh, Borneo will become more important in the coming years, uh, but it will take a long time to develop because as, I'm, as I try to uh, uh, impart to all of you, it is such a big, uh, diverse and a big place. Uh, it's really huge, the third largest island in the world. Uh, the economic and infrastructure development uh, in the coming years will be uneven. And part of the reasons why it's very difficult to build infrastructure is because of the population remains very small, okay? Seven, 20 years from now, uh, you will not get a population more than 50 million. You'll be a lot less than that, okay? Uh, much of Borneo's political importance will also be dependent on what happens in South China Sea, where the upper conflict breaks out, and of course, whether the new Indonesian administrative capital will be built. Uh, it is highly unlikely at the present moment, and also in the immediate future. Uh, that Sabah and Sarawak will benefit from Kalimantan's economic pot uh, potential uh, until certain links are resolved. And I'm talking about uh, simple administrative issues, things like the border link issue. Uh, the borders are still not linked. Uh, there is still no free movement of goods and services and the people uh, between uh, Malaysia, Borneo, and Kalimantan. 
Uh, there is no road system linking us. Uh, there's no, the air linkage is, is, is uneven. For example, there's only one flight a day, sorry, three flights a week between Pompiana and Kuching, things like that. Okay. And of course, uh, issues of self determination or identity politics will remain unresolved in Sabah and Sarawak. And that, of course, will fit into uh, uh, how politics will run for the whole island as a whole, and especially relations between Sabah and Sarawak, federal capital, plus Sabah and Sarawak and Kalimantan. And of course, the, the PTI issue, uh, it is my contention that this issue uh, will not be resolved in the next 20 years. Thank you very much, and thank you for listening. Mm. Thank you, James. Very, very, very good, um, if you like, um, enlightening presentation, because that's we, now it sort of encapsulates what we've been talking about today. What you all know already that's happening around this region from Sabah, and Borneo and, and the grievances that are obviously happening uh, even as we speak. So there's a lot of things that Sabah have problems with and it could be to do with the uh, peninsula or, or something else. But James' observation is very, very good. Of course, we are always um, happy to, to bring him along because he's, he's such an um, giving us a different perspective from an outside point of view, if you like, from an academic in some ways. and helping us to learn what is happening in our own country. Because I said the country, this country of Sabah in that case. Now we, we, we literally run out of time, but hopefully 